Hello again, this is the second part of the introduction to semantics and pragmatics. In this second part, we're going to explore some basic concepts in semantics and pragmatics, and we're going to start by looking at the concept of synonymy. If we read each of these expressions, do you want to go to the movies? What about going to the movies? Let's go to the movies. It'll be nice if we went to the movies. Would you like to go to the movies? We should go to the movies. We can see that all of these sentences have the same meaning and we can therefore conclude that different words or expressions can have a similar meaning and I say similar meaning because they do not have exactly the same meaning and this is called synonymy when we're talking about words and it's called paraphrase when we are talking about phrases or sentences now it is important to say that there is no real synonymy in the sense that no single word or expression can have the same meaning. So, when somebody says, did you hear me? And then a second time, did you hear me? Each of these two instances of the same question have different meaning. Okay, so the first one is just a simple question and the second one is insisting because you think that probably the person is really not paying attention to you. So we can say in this sense that there are no real synonyms. Not even the same sentence has the same meaning when it's repeated. And there is something else. If you see here in this interaction here, the boy says, what's wrong? And the girl replies, nothing. We can see that there is something very important to say about meaning. And in general terms, if the girl is saying, that sh there's nothing wrong, we may understand that there is no problem at all. But we know very well that if she is saying nothing, this means that she is so angry that she doesn't even want to explain the thing that she considers it should be obviously wrong. And so therefore, we have here something important in the field of pragmatics, okay? Semantic studies, the literal formal meaning of sentences. If we read this sentence, what's wrong, nothing, we say, okay, there is no problem. Then again, pragmatic studies, the contextual intended meaning of utterances, and we understand that pragmatically, the girl means you are in big trouble. So the meaning is different. There is a literal meaning, which is the study of semantics, and there is an intended um, contextual negotiated, meaning invisible even, that is the field of study of pragmatics. Now let's talk about form, meaning and use to better understand the relationship between grammar, semantics and pragmatics. So first of all we can say that language has three dimensions. The first one is the form or the structure, so how the linguistic units are formed. The second dimension is the meaning and it's semantics that studies that and the question is here what does it mean but finally the third dimension of language is pragmatics and then in this case we study how when and why we use these linguistic forms so just to explain this in more detail the form refers to the phonemic graphemic and morphosyntactic patterns the meaning refers to the lexical and grammatical meaning and finally the use refers to the linguistic, social and discord context in which these forms are used. Now, using this three-dimensional analysis we can look at some sentences such as this one Carl lets Green ideas sleep furiously, the duck ran up to Mary and licked her long time no see, boys will be boys, or business is business, I'm not here, and every cloud has a silver lining, we can see that in some cases there are some sentences that are grammatically correct, such as colorless green ideas live furiously, but semantically they do not make sense. But when we look at pragmatics we may say if this is poetry, if this was created with the mean of expressing beautiful uh, thoughts, we can say that this will be perfectly appropriate. If somebody, if we're in, you know, if we're reading a poetry book and we, and we read this, 
colorless green ideas live furiously, we say, oh, that's so beautiful. That's, that's so uh, romantic even, okay? But the truth is that um, that sentence was created by Noam Chomsky to explain that sometimes grammatically some sentences could be correct, but they could have no meaning, okay? But then we see it depends on the use, okay? If you're, if you're showing me that and you tell me this is poetry, I say, okay, beautiful, I like it, it's, it's wonderful. But, of course, if you say that in a conversation, that would make no sense at all. So, all of these sentences can be seen under different perspectives. When we see the third one, long time no see, we perceive it as being grammatically correct, but in fact, all of the grammar is messed up. There is no subject in the sentence, everything is in the wrong order. You know, we have a negative statement that is based only on you know the, the the combination of no plus the verb and so grammatically the sentence is incorrect but we perceive it as correct because people use this all the time it's an expression that we understand just like that as a single unit we don't analyze the grammar but of course again the fact that semantically we can understand the words long and time and no and see this gives us the idea of what the sentence means and therefore we see no problem with it but the truth is as i said before that this sentence is ungrammatical we could have some other instances in which we repeat something there are these circular st statements such as boys will be boys and business is business but we understand that the first and the second boys for example do not mean the same thing so the first boys refers to boys but the second voice refers to the characteristics of make boys the way they are that means aggressivity uh, infidelity um, all of the negative things that are related to boys are represented by that second voice so we we actually mean that boys will always be the way they are and that's something that we cannot change so same thing with business is business the first one is business but the second one refers to all of the characteristics of business so this means that when i say business is business i'm telling you i don't care maybe what i'm doing is is rude what i'm doing is wrong maybe i'm being selfish but i care about my business so business is business uh same thing you know with uh with an next sentence you can never say i'm not here because you're always in the place where you speak but we understand when somebody says that that the person doesn't want to be bothered Okay, and finally, every cloud has a stable lining, can only be analyzed in the context of use because we understand that it's an expression to, um, to tell you to be optimistic. So we say every, after every dark situation, there is something good, there's something positive. And of course, because we associate the clouds with, with storm, with rain, with bad weather, but then the silver lining is the, sh is the, the sunshine that is behind the cloud. And therefore, that's the way in which we perceive the meaning. So we can conclude that this, the correctness and the sense of a form, of a sentence, a word, an expression, can only be understood as an interplay of meaning and use. Now, we are going to make the point now that semantic denotation is the process whereby words refer to specific entities in the real world. But pragmatic reference is the way in which words refer to anything that we want them to re refer to. Okay, And we're going to look at some examples of this. So we can make a point now that when we say super es nada to refer to a boyfriend, there's nothing in the words peor and nada that could refer to a person or to a boyfriend in particular, but we use this expression to refer to somebody's boyfriend or girlfriend. Same thing with the watch Macaulay, we use it to refer to any object that we want that we probably don't want to mention or that we don't know the name of. Uh, same thing, the place that we went to the other day because maybe we don't remember or we wanted to keep it secret, right? And this is the case with this last expression, luego me pasas lo que ya sabes. So, you, we're talking to another person, we have shared meaning and we don't want other people to know what we're talking about, so we're going to say like that and the person that is involved in this conversation knows exactly 
what the other person means. And therefore, we can conclude that meaning is constructed in collaborative reference and inference between speaker and listener. So this means that the notation is a semantic concept, words have meanings, but then reference is a pragmatic concept, and in this case we can use any word and or expression to refer to something or someone that we want. Now let's continue talking about reference. So there are different words that can be nouns, phrases, expressions that refer to something, such as Shakespeare and friends and a dog and AMLO and my crush, facultad de lenguas, the teacher, cambio climático, the Brexit, pragmatics, and so on. So then each of these words can be used to refer to something to which they might not be primarily related, okay? So we can say that reference is an act in which a speaker or writer uses linguistic forms to enable a listener or reader to identify someone or something. Now, there are different kinds of referring expressions such as proper nouns, indefinite or indefinite noun phrases, pronouns, and the choice of one type of referring expression rather than another one seems to be based to a large extent on what the speaker's goals are and also on what he assumes that the listener already knows. So this selection of reference is not something casual, is not something random, we have a purpose in mind. We want to express our feelings or, and, or, or attitude towards something and that's why we're going to select one referring expression or another one. Now in some other cases we're going to use something that is attribution. This means that we're going to use some characteristics to refer to people instead of using specific nouns or referring expressions. For example, we can say there's a lady out there waiting for you to say who the person that is waiting is. Same thing when we say she wants to marry a man with a lot of money. We don't talking about any man in particular, but we just mention the characteristics of the man that she wants to marry. Same thing with I need a cable to connect my computer to my TV. So we're saying what kind of cable it is because probably we don't know the name of it or probably because we don't want to mention it. The killer is still on the run. So this word killer is being used to attribute an action to the person that is, that is being searched by the police. Same thing, she's still waiting for Prince Charming. By saying Prince Charming, we refer to specific characteristics of the man that she's waiting for. So when we have attributive use, we can use indefinite or definite noun phrases that can be used to describe entities that are assumed to exist, but may be unknown or may not exist at all. Now these expressions themselves cannot be treated as having specific reference, but they are invested with referential function in a context by a speaker and a listener. Now, something that we can say about names and reference is that they may refer to something different than the original meaning. For example, when we say that Picasso cost a fortune, we're not talking about the painter Pablo Picasso, but we're talking about one of his paintings. Same thing, the tuna sandwich left without paying, we're referring to a customer who ordered a tuna sandwich and didn't pay. Your 1 p.m. just canceled, same thing. You know, the, um, a receptionist to a doctor may say that to refer to the person who had a schedule at 1 p.m. I hated Shakespeare at school. It's not that I hated Shakespeare himself, but maybe reading his works in a particular course. And when I say my Rolling Stones is missing, I'm not talking about the band. I'm, I'm talking about my, my, uh, my, um, my Rolling Stones collection. Can I borrow your Nike? Then again, we have an example. This brand can be used to name a specific pair of sneakers. And we also know that the brand Nike makes reference to uh, Nike, the goddess, the Greek goddess of victory. When we say Brazil beat France, of course, we mean a sports team, not the actual countries. 
and that's why sometimes the names can be used to refer to something different than the original meaning. In this last example, the US cancelled the trade agreements, we're talking about the US government. We can then conclude that the collaborative process of reference also works between members of a community who share a common language and culture, and therefore specific entities such as authors and brands and musicians can be identified and associated to objects through a pragmatic connection. And of course, the correct interpretation also depends on the code text, which provides a range of reference. So it is important to say not just the referring expression, but also to see what other words, what other elements are related to it, so that we can understand what they actually refer to. These examples show you the importance of the code text in the identification of the referent. When we say Brazil won the World Cup, we understand because we see the World Cup that we are talking about the Brazilian soccer team. In the second example, Brazil won the election and will be the host of the Olympic Games. We understand, because we see Olympic Games, that we're talking about the Brazilian Olympic Committee. In the third example, Brazil is protest protesting against the excessive taxes. We understand, because we see protesting and excessive taxes, that we're talking about the people of Brazil, the citizens. In this next example, Brazil is one of the favorite tour destinations. We know that we're talking about Brazil as a territory about the cities of Brazil and all of the, the territory of that country. And finally, if somebody says meet me at the corner of Argentina and Brazil, we understand that the person is talking about the name of a street. Now, it is important to see that this reference can be used to convey particular meanings and intentions. For example, when we see these two political ads, we can see that the words that are used and the reference that they have are very important political messages to call people indirectly to vote for the parties. So Morena, this, this political party, is called like that because of course they want to make reference to the color of Mexican people's skin, right? They also want to refer probably to um, the Virgin of Guadalupe and of course they call themselves the hope of Mexico because they want to show that they're probably the only solution that their country has to have a better future. In the second example, when this person chooses to be called Lalo is because he wants to appear closer to the people as somebody who's a friend, somebody that we can trust and of course it's better than, than to be called Eduardo Rivera something, right? So we're seeing here that this is not casual. These specific referring expressions are used because there is some interest, there's some intention of attracting people and then of course have them vote for these candidates. The, in the same way, finally, the word amarra, if you see it's something that is related to some physical action, but in this case, they want to tell you that it is very sure that, he, that he's a winner, that he has already, you know, the, the candidacy of his political party. And we can see that eventually, right now, he became the, uh, the mayor of the city of Puebla. So, we can just conclude now that reference depends on the local context and the local knowledge of the participants. That means Morena works in Mexico, but if even another country you try to call the political party Morena, it will not have the same effect. So then, reference is not simply a relationship between the meaning of a word and a phrase, and then an object or a person in the world, but it is a social act in which the speaker assumes that the word or phrase used will be interpreted by the listener as intended, that we are going to achieve our purposes in using these words to refer to these people or things. Now we're going to talk about another particularly interesting phenomenon in semantics, and this is called entailment. Now entailment refers to the fact that when we say something, such as she parked outside the school, 
there are some logical consequences of this that can also be assumed. So if it's true that she parked outside the school, we also mean or it also logically follows that she has a car, number one, number two that she knows how to drive, and number three that she didn't park inside the school. So if the first sentence is true, the three other entailments are also true because it's just a matter of logical thinking. Second example, I almost finished my homework. If I say that, by the same token, I am meaning that I am a student, that I had homework on that particular day, that I did most of it, and that I haven't finished, okay? So, if it's true that I almost finished my homework, by the same token, it is also true that I'm a student, that I have homework, that I did most of it, and that I haven't finished. So this is what we call entailment. Something that logically follows from something that is said or written. And let's see the other side of meaning which is called implicature and which is a pragmatic concept. If we look at these same sentences now in the, the context of a conversation, we could say for example that if A says the teacher's got car got stolen and B says really and then A replies again well she parked outside the school the meaning of she parked outside the school that can be interpreted is that it was obvious that the car was going to be stolen because we know that there are lots of criminals outside the school so this is the implicature the interpretation of an utterance based on some shared knowledge that speaker and listener have. In the second example, A says, when you go to the movies, and B replies, I almost finished my homework. So then again, we have the same sentence, but now in context, we can interpret it as saying, yes, I want to go with you, just give me a minute. So if you see the interpretation, the entailment is very different from the entailment, because in the entailment is something that logically follows. We're not guessing, we're not interpreting, we're not trying to find the meaning. But implicature refers to just that. Implicature means you're saying something and then I interpret what you say based on my knowledge of the topic, on my knowledge of the world, and then I understand what you're saying. So, this interpretation that we make of the intended meaning of an utterance using contextual information is what we call an explicature. Let us now turn to another important concept in pragmatics. Pragmatics is doing things via the language. So we need to understand three important concepts. First of all, locutionary act, and then the illocutionary act, and finally the prolocutionary act. So the locutionary act refers to what we say the sentences themselves. The elocutionary act refers to what you mean by that sentence and we call this an utterance. An utterance is a sentence in context with a particular intention on the part of the speaker. And finally the prolocutionary act refers to what you get. In other words the response or reaction from your interlocutor. Here's one example. A boy says something to a girl. Okay, we're going to see the locutionary, elocutionary, and prolocutionary act. So the boy says, what are you doing this weekend? And then of course, when a boy says that to a girl, we understand that the implied meaning, the invisible meaning, the intended meaning is, would you be willing to go on a date with me? So this thing is not said, but it's implied. Okay, so finally, we see that if we have a question, what are you doing this weekend? The logical answer will be an explanation of the activities that she's going to do. And she could say something like, well, I'm going to sleep in and then I'm going to eat breakfast, blah, blah, blah. But we know that this is not the answer. So there are two possible courses of action that the girl is going to take. If she's interested in the boy, she could say something like, nothing important, why? And so the boy can now ask the invitation. He can actually tell her to go out on a date with him. 
but if she doesn't like him, she could probably reply something along these lines. I'm going to the movies with my boyfriend. And then the boy will know that she is not willing, she is not available to go out on a date with him and he, he will stop insisting. So we can see here that we say something but those words that we have have intentions and therefore they have a different meaning that is going to be interpreted by our interlocutor which is going to respond by accepting an invitation or rejecting an invitation by complaining, apologizing and things like that. This is what we call illocutionary acts. Pragmatic stand can be defined as the study of how language is used in communication. It is especially concerned with how meaning is conveyed by a speaker or writer and then with how that language is interpreted by the listener or reader. So, pragmatics deals more with what people mean by the utterances than what the words or phrases or sentences mean by themselves. So it is the study of implied meaning, negotiated meaning, invisible meaning that we convey when we express ourselves by means of different kinds of utterances. We can see then that meaning can only be understood as this very complex interplay of the semantic properties of the linguistic elements that we use and of course there are implied senses that are locally negotiated in the course of communicative interaction. So to understand meaning we need to use semantics and we also need to use pragmatics. Therefore semantics and pragmatics will study different but related things. Semantics is concerned with the literal denotational meaning of words and sentences and pragmatics with the contextual negotiated meaning of those words and sentences in a particular situation. In the same way, semantic studies the denotation, the conventional meaning of words and expressions, but then pragmatic studies how these words are used with some intentions as reference and how they are interpreted by means of inference by the speaker and the listener. Semantic studies the form of sentences to analyze the meaning of each unit, but pragmatic studies how utterances are expressed in a conversation to perform speech acts. And finally, semantics is going to study entailment. This means the logical consequences of something that is said, but pragmatics is going to study implicature. This means the interpretation that we're going to have of a word or a sentence because of the contextual information that we have. And so, this is a little summary of what semantics and pragmatic studies. We can see that both of them study meaning, but they study it in different ways. Semantic studies, the literal conventional meaning, but pragmatic studies, the contextual negotiated meaning in interaction. Thanks a lot for your attention and I will be seeing you in our next lesson.